Hi, I'm Liz hirshnoff Tolly, and welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection podcast. And the purpose of this podcast is to not talk about politics and policy, rather to speak with elected leaders about the heart and the humanity. So many times people will say, oh, he's just a politician or it's just a cutout. And uh, what I've learned is that many of our elected leaders are really truly amazing people. And today's guest is somebody who is very special. He is young, he is honest, and he is out there really working for people in his community. While I was doing a little bit of research and looking into him, one of the things that really struck me was his honesty in talking about going through depression. And I've had family members that have struggled with depression, friends of family, and it's just, it is something that we all deal with. And I think that the fact that he's able to talk about it in such an honest and comfortable way shows really what leaders are about, which is not just saying what people want to hear, but really talking about what people need to hear and making people feel like we're all in this together. So it's really an honor and a pleasure to welcome my guest, who is Richie Torres. Richie is currently New York 15th District Congressman, and he, interestingly enough, at 25, he became New York's youngest elected official serving in the New York City Council. And he is the first openly LGBTQ person elected to this office in the Bronx. And by the way, my father grew up in the Bronx, just to put some perspective in this. Just to give clarity of what your district is before I start speaking is you have the neighbor, a lot of neighborhoods, Allerton, Bathgate, Baychester, Belmont, Claremont, Fordham, Melrose, Mauriciana, Morris Park, Mott, Haven, Riverdale, Sputton, Duville, Tremont, Olinville, Norwood, Highbridge, Van Nest, West Farms, Williamsbridge, Woodlawn, so many neighborhoods. It's pretty incredible. And you have a very diverse- and a, a lot very, of institutions too. A lot of institutions. Yeah, the, the Bronx Zoo, the Botanical Garden, right. Fordham University, Arthur Avenue, Little Italy. Yeah, and also a very poor also community of folks but people that really do care. Rich in spirit, but need support and need uh, assistance. And just to finish your introduction, upon swearing in, you were the first openly gay Afro-Latino American member of Congress. You're a lot of firsts. And I wanna welcome you. And thank you for coming to the Capital Coffee Connection Podcast. We're having some coffee. I wanna go back to like the beginning of Richie time, because I know that you have a very special relationship with your mom and growing up was really challenging and it made you who you are today, but could you talk a little bit about what your mom went through, how she, what her struggles were, and you as a child and your relationship? So my mother is the most important person in my life. The starting point was the Bronx. I was born and raised in the Bronx. I spent almost all my life in poverty. Most of my life I was raised by a single mother who had to raise three of us on minimum wage, yeah. which in the 1990s was $4.25 an hour. So I tell people, imagine being a single mother in the most expensive city in America, yeah. raising three children on $4.25. And so my mother is my hero. I feel like the South Bronx is full of single mothers like mine who have struggled and sacrificed and suffered so that their children can have a fighting chance yeah. and a decent life with the American dream. Uh, my mother raised us in public housing, which is so chronically underfunded, that it has some of the worst conditions, mold and mildew, leaks and lead, without reliable heat and hot water in the winter. And ironically, I actually grew up in a public housing development right across the street from Trump Golf Course. And as the golf course was undergoing construction, I kid you not, it actually unleashed a skunk infestation. So On top I, of everything else. Yes. Uh, and I tell people, I've been smelling the stench of Donald Trump up before he became president. Yeah. Yeah. But as the golf course was undergoing construction and as conditions in my home were getting worse, uh, the city had invested $100 million uh, in a golf course dedicated to Donald Trump. And I remember asking myself at the time, what does it say about our society? And you were just a little boy. Well, I was a teenager. Okay, but still you were young, quite young. But like, what does it say about our society that we're putting more money into a golf course yes. than into the home support people of color in public housing? Yeah. So that left an impression of and you also were affected health-wise from this. You had issues and you were you had to get medical care for being in that kind of an environment. 
I, I mean, for most of my life, I was in three places. I had a home, school, or the emergency room. You know, I grew up near the Cross Cross Expressway, and I had severe struggles with asthma. And I was in and out of the emergency room, and my mother had to take time off of work, which meant lost income. Yeah. I'm a twin. Uh, so we're... Who was first, you or him? He is biologically older. I'm temperamentally older. <laughs> okay, great. But we're five, five, five minutes apart. It's actually an interesting story. So yeah. I, in 1987, my mother was watching the movie La Bamba. Right. And she was inspired to name me after Richie Bell. Okay, great. So Richie with a T, R-I-T-C-H-I, right. and Richie Rich. And she named my brother after the Reuben sandwich. Which was her favorite sandwich? Must have been her favorite sandwich. At that time. But he's a Latino, but his 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 name has the Jewish spelling rather than the Latino spelling. It's funny. But I tell people the fact that she named me after the musician must mean that I'm the favorite son. Okay, well, I'm not going to talk about that because <laughs> I'm sure Ruben is very special as well. And you have a sister. I do. Yeah, I have quite a few siblings. So I have okay. a sister from, I have a twin brother. Yeah. I have a sister from my mother's side. Great. With whom I grew up. Okay. Uh, and then I have five siblings from my father's side. Wow. Uh, and I met each of them at least on one occasion. I met my, first time I met my two half-brothers was actually in prison. So the two of them went to federal prison in 1994. There's even a New York Times article about it. I remember going to federal prison to meet them for the first time. And I remember asking my brother, you know, what do you plan to do with your life when you're no longer in prison? And he said to me, if I can't find a job, you're going to go back to the same life I had before. So, so really it influences who you are now yeah, as a These leader. experiences yeah. like have had a lasting impact on my thinking about politics and policy in life. Yeah. And talk a little bit. I never thought I would be the congressman for the area where my brothers were gang leaders. Yeah, and but, so but that's, life will take. you never know where life will take yeah. you. And, and in an interesting way, and we could spend hours on this talking, it's like, this is an American story where one child can go one direction, another child goes in another direction, and it's just hard to understand. But I am sure that at this point in your life, you also appreciate so much more the people that don't have because of what you grew up with and what your siblings grew up with. And I think what I offer is a, a different kind of an dream story. It's not a rags to riches story. No. It's not a hood to Harvard story. Yeah. You know, 15 years ago, I had dropped out of college because I found myself struggling with depression. There were moments when I thought I'm taking my own life yeah. because I felt as if the world around me had collapsed. I was even hospitalized for attempted suicide. Yeah. Uh, and I never thought seven years later, I'd become the youngest elected official in America's largest city. And then seven years later, I'd become a United States Congress. It's a different kind of American story than the one we normally see in Washington. Well, it says a lot about you. Some of the people that I've spoken with can talk about a teacher or an experience that really influenced them in a positive way. Because going to school is not easy. Yeah. Did you have that teacher? Uh, my oldest teacher, Miss Rath, taught me how to write. Mm -hmm. I remember she gave me a book uh, by E.B. White, The Elements of Style, okay. uh, which is my Bible on writing. To the extent that I'm a good writer, I owe a debt to my English teacher from 11th, from 10th grade, Judy right. Math. The most brilliant person I ever met was a man by the name of Michael DeStefano. Michael DeStefano. Who passed away last year and he delivered a eulogy at his funeral. Uh, but he, he just had an encyclopedic knowledge. And about every what, he topic. was a teacher? He was a social studies teacher. He was an assistant principal. But he was the most brilliant person I've ever met. There was no one who could match his erudition, his eloquence. I, when I was a kid, I was I would watch Boy Meets World. Yeah. And he reminded me of Mr. Feeney. Okay. He was like the statesman, the wise man that everyone would look up to in Lehman High School, where I went to. Robert Leader was our principal. He was the longest serving principal in the New York City public school system. He actually got me into politics because there was a man by the name of Jimmy Baca, right. who was the head of the local community board, mm -hmm. who was looking for a young student to serve as his intern. Right. And he goes to Robert Leader and he said, do you have any recommendations? And Robert Leader says, you should vote the captain of the what team, Richie Torres. And that encounter was the beginning of a journey that led me into politics. And then Miss Peters, Gail Peters, who was my law coach. The most intellectually formative experience of my life was actually the law team. 
you know, I grew up underestimating myself. Like when I was in elementary school, I had trouble reading. I never thought of myself as a particularly gifted, bright person. Right. When I joined the law team, I realized that I had a, a talent for public speaking. I, I discovered a, a level of talent that I never thought I had. And I was the best in the city. We, you know, under my leadership, we won the citywide moot court competition two years in a row. We defeated the likes of Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech, right. Stuyvesant. The kids that came from yes. higher, better, much, better much more, funded schools. Much more privileged schools. These are the yeah. elite schools. Yeah. But we won the competition two years in a row. And I'm so glad you're sharing it because, you know, when people listen to this, and I hope young people are listening to this across the world, across the country, and hear your story because I think more people can relate to your story than the other side. And this is an opportunity for them to hear. Like you said, it's not a rag to riches, but it's a grit, hard work, and also having inspiring teachers is also really part of the chemistry. And, and it's a story in which I take pride. Yeah. Because the the essence of life is not perfection, it's progress. It's, it's nice. three steps forward and two steps backwards. And I've just been blessed. Yeah. Did you have early jobs that weren't political? Also a cool, oh, sorry, cool fact about the law team. Yeah. So in, in the final competition, I actually had an argument. I had an opportunity to argue a case about copyright infringement before actual judges of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Very impressive. One of whom was Dennis Jacobs, yeah. uh, chief judge. Uh, and it was you know, it's one level below the Supreme Court. So yeah. imagine like I'm a inner city kid yeah. who's been underestimated his whole life. And here I am winning a court case for one of the highest courts in the country. It's, it was a life-changing experience. It had to empower you. I felt empowered. Yeah. Did you have, did you have time for part time jobs, or did you just kind of go straight into like a, a working as like a volunteer in the for different people in that government? When you when you factor in internships. Yeah. I've been in government for about two decades. I was an intern in the deputy mayor's office, speaking of development, rebuilding Bloomberg administration. Right. I was a field operative, then council candidate and then eventually council member Jimmy Baca's campaign. Uh, and then I became his housing director. So even though I'm only 35, I have almost two decades of experience in local and federal government. Yeah. And I read I'm some, an old soul. you're an old soul, young body, but I also read somewhere that you actually would go out with your camera and take photos and well, I tell that story because I think it's an interesting one about like, a, a picture's worth a thousand words and proof is in the picture. So, you know, one of the functions of the government office is yeah. constituent service. And I was a constituent liaison. I would handle, but we would receive calls from constituents who had problems that had to be solved or questions that had to be answered. Right. And I found that the role was too passive. Like we're, we're passively receiving emails. We're passively yeah. receiving calls. So I would actually go out into the field. Yeah. I would inspect conditions in apartments. I would take pictures. I would publicly shame landlords to hold them accountable for repairing conditions. Yeah. And I took on the role of an organizer rather than a liaison passively receiving calls in a cubicle. And that's just always been my nature. I'm proactive. I try to be engaged. Right. Uh, and, and I've kept that ethos of organizing with me, even as a congressman. Yeah, well, I think it's that's what it's really about. It's about yeah. pe serving people. doesn't matter which party. It's about serving it's people. It's a people business. Yeah. What is the best advice you've ever received? And what's the worst advice you've ever received? Best advice... an appreciation for the value of gratitude. You know, for me, gratitude is not merely an emotion. Yeah. But it's it's a way of life. Gratitude yes. has the power to transform life as you experience it. So right. there's a, a metaphor known as the missing tile syndrome. Imagine for a moment, there's supposed to be 10 tiles in front of you, but only nine are present and one is missing. The human eye naturally gravitates toward the missing tile. It is human nature to notice what is missing in our lives rather than appreciate what's present. And gratitude enables us to see clearly the blessings in our lives. Yes. That's not just an emotion. That's a transformation of life itself. Yes. That's beautiful. That, that's, that's the best advice I get. Worst advice um, <laughs> is political. So when I first, when I won my city council race, one of my colleagues said, the press is the enemy. You should avoid the press at all cost. And the press is not the enemy, but she's right that there are certainly reporters who are guiding for elected officials. But the worst thing you can do is avoidance. 
you have to build relationships. You have to reveal yourself to the world. And, and so I felt like that was the single worst advice and I thankfully I rejected it. Yeah. I built relationships and I've done pretty well. Yeah, and you don't always have to agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go into a little bit rapid questions just to get to know you. You can answer in one word or a few words. You don't have to answer if you don't want, but they're supposed I'm, to be fun. I can fun. take the fifth? You can take the fifth. Okay. What is your favorite sound? Sound of water. Sound of water, yeah. okay. Favorite color? Red. Favorite smell? Favorite smell, that's a great question. Smell of a rose. I think I already know the answer, but who is your biggest cheerleader? I'm a mama's boy by mother. Deborah Vasilev. A wise Latina. A wise Latina. If you were on a desert island and you could have one meal, what would it be? I would say I, I love a ribeye steak. Ribeye steak. Yeah, with uh, medium rare. Okay. That's one of my favorite meals. Okay. Um, I'm sure they'll have that on the island, the ribeye steak. Um, what is your favorite music? I mean, I know you're named after Richie Valens and La Bamba, but what is your the, what music do you listen to if you're... Do you exercise? Do you have time to exercise? I've been exercising for the last year. Okay, good. What is your exercising. exercise? So we'll see weightlifting. I need okay. to incorporate cardio. Yeah. But we'll see weightlifting. Um, because I after that, you know, I see my, I'm serving with colleagues who are much older than I am. Uh -huh. I said, you know, I want to prevent myself from falling apart, so I should probably start exercising. Good. Uh, so I, I do chest, triceps, biceps, arms. Yeah, yeah. What kind of music do you listen to? It varies, but you know, it could be Park Anthony, it could be Jennifer Lopez, even just theme songs from movies, just to motivate you, like it's listening to Rocky music. Yeah, yeah. So that I can feel motivated to lift it. weights in the gym. Yeah. What is your favorite household chore? If you had to do one thing in the house and you'd say, ah, oh, this is my favorite one, what would it be? The most tolerable is washing dishes. Tolerable is washing yes. dishes. I enjoy none of it. Your mother didn't make you do much, did she, at the house? No, I did, but I hated it. You hated it. So, okay. The washing dishes. Okay. Better uh, than doing the laundry. Better than laundry. And I think I kind of get it, but could you sort of tell us what your superpower is? I think everyone has a superpower. There's a concept known as anti-fragility. Okay. So Frederick Nietzsche once said that, which does not kill you, makes you stronger. Right. Uh, and, and I'm anti-fragile. I'm made better, stronger, and wiser by the struggles of my life. That's my superpower. If you could go anywhere in the world that you haven't been, and I know you've probably, with as a congressperson, started to travel a little bit more, but if you could personally go anywhere, where would that be? I serve on the China Committee. I've never been to China. So you're going to have to go to China? Whether it's safe to go to China, I don't know. But, but, <laughs> not today, but, but you'll go. But I would love to go to China one day. Um, you know, I was thinking about you when I was preparing this, and I think it's sort of already made very clear, but, you know, James Baldwin wrote in 1962 in an essay, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, which sort of sounded like you before I got to actually speak with you. I heard that. I feel like, you know, the world is not going to change on its own. We have to change it. Yeah. Like the burden falls on us. Yeah. To reshape the world in the mold of our ideals, our highest ideals, our highest values. You know, the one of the central values of Judaism is to Kunalam. That we have not we have a we have an obligation to repair what is broken in the world and I take that to heart. Yeah. I'm not Jewish, but I'm Jewish. I, I get <laughs> it. What do you what is your faith and how does that play a part in who you are? I'm culturally Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I alternated between Catholicism and Protestantism. I identify as cult culturally Christian. Yeah. And obviously you know a little bit about Judaism, so you've taken time to understand different religions and the importance they play. I have a, like a rudimentary knowledge, and uh, I represent a substantial Jewish community in Riverdale, and, and I'm, I'm a Zionist. I, I've been traveling to Israel. I've been thinking about Israel for about a decade. Right. It's become a important cause in my life. So yeah, I, I know a lot about it. And, and I... Love. I don't want to go too far into politics, but I, I love initiatives like the e Ram Accords because I want to live in a world where Jews, Christians, and Muslims come together and live in peace and prosperity. Yeah, and I don't think that is actually partisan. That is, I mean, that is a that is something that is partisan. It's not bipartisan. I think that most people recognize that uh, if you can talk and you can do and negotiate and have diplomacy and have relationships, 
the world will just be a better place. And in this case, the Abraham Accord, which was started under a Republican administration, and it's not, and now it's being carried through with the Democratic administration. It is really who we are as a country, which is, I believe, guiding others, and hopingly we guide ourselves to figure out how we work together. And, and to, you know, to that James Baldwin quote, you know, we need not be prisoners of the past. We can create a new future. What do you do on a day where it just feels like everything is falling apart? Like, what is your, like, technique or what do you say to yourself? How do you just pick yourself back up? I will remind myself this, this too shall pass. Yeah. And I might take a walk. Where I have the luxury of living near Arthur Abbey, which has some of the best Italian restaurants in the country. Okay. Has the highest concentration of businesses owned by the same family for more than 100 years, so I might go to Italian restaurant and have a lovely meal, glass of wine, relax. Sounds good. As much as I can. Yeah, it's beautiful. And do it alone. <laughs> we'll listen to a podcast. Yeah, well, hopefully you'll listen to this podcast or some of the other of your uh, colleagues that you perhaps don't know all their stories. So um, it sounds like a it sounds like a smart and nice way to take care of yourself. And then I also I might go to the New York Botanical Garden. It's just gorgeous. They are the gorgeous. Gorgeous place. On Earth. I agree. And you can just walk for hours yeah. there. It's just beautiful. That. And it doesn't really matter if it's summer or winter. It's always got something and it's just very, um, you feel like you've gone completely far away from New York City. I have a friend who invited me to his cabin in Saranac Lake. And since I had never been there, I took the opportunity. It was about a year ago. Right. It's like one of the few true vacations I've ever took in, taken in my life. He did not tell me that there was no electricity. <laughs> uh, I was going to strangle him. <laughs> because a congressman without uh, w without connection to the internet is a problem. But it was actually one of the most relaxing, rejuvenating experiences of my life. And I, for the first time, I was able to fully appreciate and engage with nature. Yeah. And it was just a mental health break that I needed. Yeah. Well, I, and the world survived and your district survived, and but it's hard. The, the world can survive. Yeah. Relax. We need you, but we can survive without you for a few days. And before you can help others, you have to help yourself. True. I say that often to myself and to others. So now we play this game called Kiss Mary Trash. It's got other names. I know you're smiling. I keep it sort of Kiss Mary Trash because it's cleaner. And again, you can take the fifth or you can rate how you would do these things. They're kind of easy, but I hope they're fun. Ping pong, bowling, or pool? Bowling. Okay. And what's your least favorite of those things? Pool. Okay. We kind of know you don't probably relax too much, but if you were going to relax, Netflix, reading, or meditating? Reading. That you and Mary? Yeah. Are you big on meditating? I I wish I were. I, I'm not calm enough to be a meditator. Yeah. I feel like it. I have trouble staying still. Yeah. I'm active. And if you watch Netflix, or what do you watch on when you watch TV? I might watch... You know, either a new show or uh, like I, when I was a kid, I used to watch The Karate Kid. So I yep. loved the show Cobra Kai. Yeah. I love the thought of a show that's reviving um, movies from the 1980s and 1990s. So I enjoy Cobra Kai. Uh, there's, there's a show about a sociopath who kills every woman with whom he's fallen in love you. And you like that one? It's it's an interesting. It's not interesting. not that I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I enjoy sociopathy, but it's just an interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Which one would you marry? Which one would you kiss? And which one would you trash? I prefer dinner the most and lunch the least. Okay. Music, pop, country, or hip hop? The Bronx is the first place of hip hop, so I have I'm married to hip hop by definition. By definition, yeah. Movies in general, drama, rom com, or thriller. Drama. Drama? Yeah. Best. And then if you're going to eat, I know you have really good Italian, but is it Mexican, Japanese, or Italian? What would be your top? I have Bronx, Little Italy, so Italian. Italian. Okay. And which pasta? Because I've always asked a lot of folks, and I think it's always interesting. Marry, trash, kill, whatever you want to do, but fusilli, penne, spaghetti. Penne. The best. Yeah, I love penne. What sauce? Uh, vodka. Penne vodka. Yeah. The last one is sports. Basketball, baseball, football. Uh, baseball's popular. I, I represent Yankees Stadium. Yeah. And I, I was a third-rate baseball player. 
third rate, but do you get to go to the games? Do you have time to go to some of the games? On rare occasions. Yeah. So now we're sort of at the end where I've asked, and you've talked about it, but I would love for you to expand. You talked about gratitude. My question is about joy, because my hope is that when people listen to this podcast, they will find some sort of, not, I, I don't know if it's joy, but it, there'll be some sort of like a feeling of, wow, this is an impressive story. This is a person that has told amazing stories. And we'll share that with others because I think what people need in this day and age is to share things that are positive, things that actually spread good energy. There's enough bad stuff, but the more we as individuals can share, and so my question is about joy because if you are joyful, then you share your joy. So I was wondering if you could talk about maybe what joy means to you what brings you joy, and then how you share joy. For me, joy is the will to live. Well, the suffering is the nature of the human condition. What enables us to endure the suffering of life, what enables us to fill ourselves is joy. Right. That's our motivating power. That's what enlightens us. You know, Stoicism tells us that Emotion is the root of human suffering. I disagree with that. Like, you know, we're not purely rational creatures. We are emotional creatures. We need emotions like joy to motivate us to live fully. Yeah. So for me, joy is the key to the life well met. And when you- I don't mean to disagree with the Stoics. But no, no, I think you're absolutely, there's a lot that you're but, saying. But like that... what, what, what enables me to, look, I, I'm in a job that is extraordinarily training and demanding. And what enables me to wake up every day right. to work my heart out and sacrifice a personal life yes. is joy. I find joy, I find meaning, I find purpose in the public service that I require. Yeah. So it's a, it's a gift that God has given us and I, I cherish every moment of joy. Thank you. Well, on that I'm going to say thank you and I have cherished and really appreciated this opportunity. You are a special person, you are a unique person, and you are powerful because you are willing to share yourself. And I hope that more and more elected people and more and more people will share themselves because I truly believe if we share ourselves, then we have the opportunity to not only understand other people, but to grow in within ourselves. You know, I will leave this also just I don't know her, but having even like great admiration for your mother. It starts with, I think, people that influence us, that raise us. And your mom, she really knew what she was doing and she worked and she gave up a lot. And she has a son who is a, a congressperson. And that is not just only a testament to her, you know, dedication, but to her inspiration to you to do what you can do to make this world a better place. I couldn't agree more. I tell people, you know, authenticity is not only good morals, it's good politics. I think people are craving for authenticity. Yeah. So thank you. We've shared some authenticity and I hope some joy. And uh, you have a very special story. And thank you for doing what you do. It is a lot. You give up a lot of personal time, but um, we in our country and I think around the world are benefits of what you have done. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Ciao.